There are four vital elements needed for life. Number one is oxygen, and we've looked at the importance of oxygen many times this week. Number two is water. Our body from the neck down is 75% water, from the neck up 85% water. The third most vital element needed for life is sodium. And the fourth is potassium. Water. One of the first questions I ask people when they come to me for help with their health is how much water do you drink? Here are some of the answers. Oh, I don't like water. Another answer is not much. Another answer is I don't drink water or I'm visiting the little house all day. Another answer is if I drink too much water, my, my legs swell. These last two answers tell me that the water is not getting inside the cell. You know, there's been some deaths on the Kokoda Trail and these people are drinking five litres of water a day. They're perspiring huge amounts. So the water's going in and the water's coming out, but it's not coming out as water. Have you ever licked your perspiration? It's very salty. These people are losing a lot of sodium, but not just sodium, they're losing a lot of other minerals. So how do we get the water inside the cell? Because these people just drinking water, the water is bypassing the cell and just coming straight out in the form of perspiration or urine. But both perspiration and urine is just not water that's coming out. Yes, waste is coming out, but there are also minerals that are being lost. So how do we get the water inside the cell? To look at that, we need to go to the third most vital element needed for life, which is sodium. We need to look at the way sodium is found in nature. Seawater contains 92 minerals. Seawater is often called an isotonic solution because it is the exact same mineral and proportion as is found in the body. Of those 92 minerals, 30% is made up of sodium and approximately 50% is made up of chloride. Because sodium chloride makes up the largest amount of the minerals, when the water is evaporated from the seawater, the first crystals formed are sodium chloride. And so what happens is usually that is scooped up, it is bleached white, aluminium is put with it so it runs freely. There's your table salt. Table salt contains two minerals. And those two minerals are sodium chloride. Sodium chloride are such harsh minerals that if you were to inject sodium chloride straight into the veins, you would kill the person. Sodium chloride, they are both essential to the body. Sodium's the third most vital element needed for life, but we need to be taking sodium into our body the way it's found in nature with all of its other minerals. The salt that we use is Celtic salt. And Celtic salt contains 82 minerals. That's pretty close. Where are the other 10? They're in such pico proportions, barely measurable, that it's impossible that a few are lost. But hey, 82 is still a lot closer to 92 than two. As I said, sodium and chloride are both important. Sodium is used everywhere in the body. It's in its largest abundance on the outside of the cell. We call that extracellular fluid. And the largest concentration of mineral inside the cell is potassium. Potassium is found in rich abundance in all your fresh fruits and vegetables. Chloride. Our hydrochloric acid is made from chloride, so chloride is important. So often people are told that they need to stop salt. Why are they told to stop salt? Because they're having too much of the sodium chloride, too much of the table salt. And because it's in an imbalanced form, it's causing an imbalance in the body right down at the cellular level. Sodium chloride is such harsh 
minerals that they kill the taste buds. They're harsh when they're by themselves. They're harsh when they're not balanced with all the other minerals. Have you noticed that people that use a lot of table salt, they put it on everything and they put it on even before they taste the food? <laughs> Do you know why? Because it kills the taste buds. No wonder they can't taste anything. So the more they use it, the more they have to use. Whereas Celtic salt, with all of its minerals, awakens the taste buds. You can get other salts like Himalayan salt. It has about 82 min minerals. There's a Murray River salt. And they're both like pink flakes. It's got about, I think, 75 minerals. So there are a few salts. If you're not sure on the mineral balance of your salt that you're buying, just ring the manufacturer and ask him for a mineral analysis of his salt. No, salt is important. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about salt. It's Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 13. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth. If the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. How does the salt lose its savour? I would like to suggest that this salt has lost its savour. It's Old English. It's lost its minerals. And what does the Bible say it's good for? Henceforth, good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. No, we need salt as it's found in nature with all of its other minerals. And this salt brings a balance. When someone is not having enough potassium, and if someone is not eating any fresh fruits and vegetables, their potassium levels go down. And if that same person is putting table salt on everything with its high sodium and chloride, sodium levels rise. Notice that there's a bilayered membrane around every cell and in that membrane there are sodium potassium pumps that basically look like that. And these pumps are constantly working like this, causing the sodium and the potassium to be monitored at the right levels. But if someone is getting too much sodium and not having enough potassium, then the concentration of sodium rises, the concentration of potassium lowers, and because of osmosis diffusion, too much sodium starts to merge in to the cell. When too much sodium merges into the cell, the cell swells. There's your high blood pressure. Your doctor is right. Table salt will increase blood pressure. But the answer is not no salt, because if no salt happens, then sodium levels go too low, and the little bit of sodium that is found inside the cell, it drops too low, and then the cell swells. So no salt and table salt both can contribute to high blood pressure. We need to be having salt in its balanced form with all of its other minerals. And I think you'll agree with me, what's a baked potato without salt? <laughs> what's avocado and tomato on sourdough spelt toast without salt? Salt awakens the food. And your hydrochloric acid is made from chloride. We cannot digest properly unless we're having adequate salt. Lining the gastrointestinal tract are villi. On those villi are receptor sites. And these receptor sites are to take the glucose through and into the blood. Inside that receptor site, there is a carrier. And the carrier is the one that takes the glucose through and into the blood. But the carrier says, I will not accept you glucose unless you come with a molecule of sodium. When the sodium is present, then the carrier will take the glucose through and into the blood. Let me give you straight from the horse's mouth on this. This was a sentence in the Anatomy and Physiology book. Let me give it to you. Glucose, Start again. Sodium is the main transport system of glucose across the brush border cell and into the blood. You will find that in every anatomy and physiology book. What's happening if someone's not having any salt? Well, there is a little bit of sodium in, in your food, in your fruits and vegetables. 
If there's not enough sodium around, not every bit of glucose can get into your blood, which explains why some people that go on a salt-free diet find their energy levels go down because they're not getting the nutrients out of their gut as they should and into the blood. No wonder it's the most vital element needed for life. We need it. The salt that we use here at Misty Mountain Health Retreat is Celtic salt. And that Celtic salt contains three magnesiums. It contains magnesium bromide, magnesium sulfate, and magnesium chloride. Magnesium is a water-hungry molecule, so it's always trying to pull the water into itself. That explains why on a, on a rainy day, our salt can get quite moist because magnesium is a water-hungry molecule. So when you put a crystal of the Celtic salt on your tongue and then drink a glass of water, when the crystal's on your tongue, even if it only be for a few seconds, then the mucous membranes in the mouth are absorbing, first of all, the magnesium. Remember, it's a water-hungry molecule. And that magnesium is taken via the blood straight to the cell and it pulls the water inside the cell. It is the quickest way to hydrate a body is to put that crystal of Celtic salt on your tongue, take that glass of water, and it ensures that the water is pulled inside the cell. I suggest that we do it at least once or twice a day. Here on the detox program, when guests are having the exercise program, especially in the summer and then the steam bath at night, I advise they do it about three times a day. That would be about every second glass of water. If you put the salt into the water, the magnesium in the salt will absorb all the water into it so you haven't got that free access of magnesium as easily as as you put it on your tongue, which will take it and through the blood to the cell to pull that water inside the cell. When the water goes through that membrane, there's a little motor in that membrane and as the water rushes through, that little membrane starts spinning. And the spinning of that little motor inside the cell gives us a unit of energy. So when everyone's feeling tired, mid-morning, all reaching for their Mars bar or cake or pie or sandwich, cup of coffee, just take your crystal of Celtic salt, have your glass of water, and you watch your energy levels have a little pickup. Because as we saw the other day, that stomach needs a rest between meals. It doesn't need more food. It needs water. And often the body doesn't know the difference between water and hunger. That's why if it's between meals and you're hungry, just have a glass of water. If you're feeling tired, have that little bit of salt before you have the water, and it'll pick you up. That's why if you're going to go and walk the Kokoda Trail, make sure you have a little bag of salt crystals, Celtic salt crystals in your pocket. Celtic salt has more magnesium than the Himalayan salt or the Murray River salt, and you can see it because it's just a lot wetter. The other salts do have magnesiums, but not quite as much as the Celtic salt. So if you're going to put the Celtic salt crystals into your grinder, just dry them out in the oven first before you put them into your grinder. When the weather's very, very wet, sometimes we have to take the salt out of our grinder two or three times a week, dry it out again, put it back into the grinder so that it can be ground at the table. When you think about seawater, that it's called an isotonic solution, which is it's the exact same mineral imbalance and proportion is found in blood, in found in the, in the intra and extracellular fluid in the tissues. You can see why in the sailor's manual, it says if you're shipwrecked, to start sipping little bits of seawater straight away. And it will keep you alive for many days. But if the person waits three days till they're very dehydrated, then drinks a whole glass of water, you can see that that will put the mineral balance in and out of their cells way out and they certainly can start to go a little bit mad. Also in the war, 
if the Navy had wounded men that needed a blood transfusion, they would transfuse with seawater. Remember, it's the exact same mineral balance and proportion as is found in the body. I have an interview in one of our books of a Dr. Lalangri, who is a French doctor who's written a whole book on salt. He said, there are no salt issues in France, because he said in France, we use the salt from the Celtic Sea. He said, there are three books in France written by doctors on salt. <laughs> There's no salt issue, he said, because we use the mineralized salt. He said, if someone's got high blood pressure, I put them on the mineralized salt and it can balance it out. It's only when sodium is in an imbalanced state or lost its savor, as the Bible verse says, that it becomes a problem. So when you think about it, we cry seawater, we sweat seawater, baby swims in seawater. It's this same mineral balance. What about calcium? It cannot get into the cell by itself. It needs vitamin D. When vitamin D is present, calcium can be pulled inside the cell. And when it comes into the cell, all the other minerals piggyback on the back of it. What about glucose? Glucose can't get into the cell by itself. It needs insulin. Insulin's the key that unlocks the door to allow the glucose inside the cell. How many people today are sick through ignorance? How many people are not drinking water because their feet swell or they're visiting the little house? If you have that little bit of magnesium in the form of the Celtic salt three times a day, the water will get into the cell and the feet won't swell and the person's not visiting the little house quite as much. But how many do not realize that? So they're not drinking enough water, they're not having the whole salt, and the highest source of magnesium in the vegetable kingdom is your dark greens. They're not in the sunshine because many Aussies are scared of the sun today. One lady told me that every time she goes out to put the clothes on the line, she has a hat on, sunglasses, white gloves, so the sun's not even touching her. <laughs> So many people are vitamin D deficient. As a result, calcium and mineral deficient. Do you remember on our first lecture, I showed you that a lot of research is showing that 92% of DNA damage is from the mineral deficiency. Is it because of the calcium deficiency because of the vitamin D deficiency? That's why the detective hat has to go on. Why are these things so? So many people are low in vitamin D, thus low in the minerals. Many have been given the wrong message on fat. They've stopped the fat, so they're hungry all day, so they're overdoing the carbohydrates, which overworks the pancreas. The pancreas getting weary, stops producing the insulin, and the glucose can't get in. Can you see this scenario? Water can't get in, minerals can't get in, glucose can't get in. And when you think about it, this is the CBD. This is the central business district of the whole of the human body inside the cell. The body says, we've got a crisis here. We can't get the basic nutrients and requirements for this CBD to function in. So the body says, we've got one more thing up our sleeve. We'll just force it in. What's that called? Blood pressure. That's what blood pressure is. It's a pressure building up to force these things in the cell because we're at a crisis level. So what is the cause of high blood pressure? There are many causes. But let me write this down for you so you can put it together. High blood pressure. And with some people, it'll be every one of these points. And with some people, it won't be. That's why the detective hat has to be put on. High blood pressure can be caused by dehydration. In dehydration, little capillary networks shut down to try and conserve full blood volume. That builds up pressure. High blood pressure can be caused by no salt. High blood pressure can be caused by table salt. High blood pressure can be caused by no greens. No greens, no magnesium, water can't get in. 
high blood pressure can be caused by no sun. No sun, no vitamin D, minerals can't get in. High blood pressure can be caused because of inactivity. When you exercise, you get the circulation of the blood out of the internal organs or areas of the body and out to the extremity, which takes pressure off the heart. High blood pressure can be caused because of a high sugar, high carbohydrate diet. We'll say high sugar, high wheat. Earlier in the week, I showed you how this wheat is getting that blood sugar level up too high, wearing out the pancreas. It can be caused because of a no fat diet with probably small amounts of margarine and of course no fat is referring nothing at all. No fat will say or margarine. Wow. You see there's more to high blood pressure than meets the eye. High blood pressure can be caused of constant distress. I don't say stress because everyone has a bit of stress in their life. And one man said to me, I love stress. It keeps me working hard. <laughs> I get heaps done. So then I had to define distress. Constant distress is wearing for the body. That's why if there's constant distress, you have to find out why and what can be done to alleviate that. With some people, it's one or two. With some people, it might be all of them. And if you don't turn the tap off, you're still going to be mopping up in the other corner. What's also necessary to keep that blood nice and thin to prevent high blood pressure is blood thinners. So let me give you a list of blood thinners. There's no need for rat poison. I mean, Wolfrin. Did you know that that's what Wolfrin is? It is rat poison. And there are far more powerful things that can be used that don't have the danger of the side effect of the Wolfrin. You know, there's a lot of information coming out now reassessing whether aspirin is really thinning that blood effectively. One newspaper article on research done six months ago, this is early 2014, they're finding out that aspirin's causing brain bleeds. Hmm. But you can thin the blood beautifully without any dangers of these drugs that I mentioned. Water, ideally two to two and a half liters per day. I'm gonna define water in a minute. That keeps the blood thin. And as we looked at earlier in the week, it needs to be taken between meals, not with meals. Celtic salt or the whole salt together with water, keeps that blood nice and thin. Cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper is a remarkable herb. You might be familiar with Jethro Kloss's book, Back to Eden. Jethro Kloss devotes half a page to every herb, 10 pages to cayenne pepper, a remarkable herb. A fantastic blood thinner. It is known to strengthen arterial walls. It's even known to repair heart muscle. If you're not used to it, just have a little bit every day. You'll get used to it. I'm used to it now. One person said, but it burns. I said, not for long. Just for a few minutes. It'll pass. <laughs> you know how the, um, the police were using capsicum spray? Do you know that after that experience, the criminal who got the capsicum spray in his eyes, he would have better eyesight? Yes, it debilitates. Oh, yes, it hurts. <laughs> but the next day, he'd be able to see better. Yes, if you're brave, you can try it. <laughs> Cayenne pepper in the eye. It doesn't sting for long, briefly. And it never hurts. One doctor in... Uh, Back to Eden, he said it's impossible to abuse cayenne pepper and it will never burn. It feels like it is, but it will never harm the tissues. Garlic, there's a lot of information coming out now, has been really for the last 10 years, on what a powerful herb garlic is regarding the blood and regarding the heart. Another blood thinner is ginger. 
Ginger is a remarkable herb. It's a potent anti-inflammatory herb, but it also is a blood thinner. So you can grate some ginger, pour boiling water on it, delicious tea. Or you can put it in all your stir fries, put it in every legume dish, delicious. And yet it's thinning your blood. Omega-3, with its three double bonds, is a blood thinner. So there's your chia seed, there's your flax seed, and the nut that is the highest in omega-3 is the walnut. So as you can see by my list here, there is no need to take drugs that have their possible side effects. We need to keep that blood nice and thin. Remember, it's the life of the flesh. We have a book in our library. We also sell this book and it's called One of the Body's Many Cries for Water. And the whole book is on water. It would probably be one of the most interesting books that I have ever read. Dr. Batman Gaheldi, we'll call him, we'll call him Dr. B because it's a difficult name. He goes into every single organ, every single part of the body and how it is affected by full hydration and how it is affected by dehydration. There are two other titles to his book. One, well, the first title is the body's, One of the Body's Many Cries for Water. The other title is He's Not Sick, He's Thirsty. Another title is Don't Treat Thirst with Medications. He was a political prisoner in India. I think it was uh, early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And in the hospital, there were a lot of sick people and he only had one thing that he could use and that was water. So no matter what the problem was, he'd give them a glass of water. 15 minutes later, he'd give them another glass of water. 15 minutes later, he'd give them another glass of water. He only did it because that's all he had. But he noticed as the days and the weeks went by, people were recovering. People with constipation were no longer constipated. People with stomach ulcers were no longer suffering from stomach ulcers. You see, the lining of the stomach has a thick mucosa wall on it and mucus is 99% water. And he shows in dehydration, it's one of the first places that we lose water, is the stomach. Inside that mucosa lining, there's sodium bicarbonate designed to neutralize stomach acid if it tries to come through. Well, in this tiny little layer here, there's no sodium bicarbonate. So very easy for the hydrochloric acid to start eating little holes in the lining of the stomach. He claims at the writing of his book to have healed 3,000 cases of stomach ulcer with water alone. He shows that a glass of water half an hour before a meal thickens that mucosa wall. Our hydrochloric acid is made from water. Today is Wednesday. Yesterday, Tuesday, I needed to drink two glasses of water so my liver could make enough hydrochloric acid for breakfast this morning. Yesterday, I needed to drink two glasses of water, another two, so my liver could make enough hydrochloric acid for lunch today. And if a person eats three meals, that's six glasses of water the day before just to make the digestive juices. Wow. That's only, that's only digestion. That's not even mentioning all the other body parts. You see, our water loss in a day, I looked at this a little earlier, so I'll recap it. Out of the kidneys, our water loss in a day is approximately 1.5 litres. Via our skin, it is approximately 0.5 of a litre. Out of our colon, it is approximately 0.3 of a litre. If someone has diarrhoea and are diarrheaing a lot, it, it could come up to 0.5, even one litre. And out of our lungs, for every exhalation, there is moisture, 0.2 of a litre. So that's a two and a half litre loss every day. And have you noticed we've got no reserve tank on the back? The only water that goes in is the water we put in. And that's what Dr. B's book is all on. He says one of the first places it's felt is the stomach. 
Another, of course, is digestion. When we don't have enough water to make the digestive juices, which are the enzymes that break our food down. He also showed that in the pancreas, it is affected by dehydration. Let me show you. In the pancreas, it releases three, actually it releases four digestive enzymes in the gut. So we'll put G gastrointestinal tract. In the pancreas, pancreatic lipase is released and it does the final breakdown of fat. Pancreatic amylase does the final breakdown on starch. And trypsin, I'll just do a trip here, it does the breakdown of protein. And chymotrypsin, it also does the breakdown of protein. So this is one, two, three, four enzymes released from the pancreas that finalise digestion. Most people don't realise that the pancreas is probably the main organ of digestion. When people die of um, pancreatic pa cancer, they usually die of malnutrition because they haven't got the fi final breakdown of their food, so their food can't get out of their gastrointestinal tract and into their blood, so they basically die of malnutrition. The pancreas also releases two hormones from the blood. And this is glycogen and insulin. Now those hormones are released into the blood and they're the ones that control our blood glucose levels. If they go too high, insulin gets it down. If they go too low, glycogen gets it up. These hormones are constantly balancing the glucose levels in our blood. Very important organ is the pancreas. All of these hormones and these ones here are made from water. So a person can develop diabetes, digestive problems, all because they're dehydrated. Let's move on down to the colon. One of the main functions of the colon is to take water out so stools are formed. If the body is dehydrated, more water gets taken out than should be taken out. Then we get rabbit pellets, uh, cement, basically there's constipation. Very difficult to have three evacuations a day, which Dr. Kellogg said is a necessity if you're having three intakes a day in a dehydrated person. Dr. B also showed that dehydration is felt in the brain. Our brain is a hydroelectric system. No hydro, no electricity. A person can suffer from depression, negative thought patterns because they're dehydrated. Something else happens in dehydration with the brain and that is the brain cells shrink. And when the brain cells shrink, that hurts. It hurts very much. When I say to people, do you get headaches? A common answer is, oh, only if I'm dehydrated. Dehydration is also felt in the lungs. Here are the little bronchioles. At the end of each bronchial, there are alveoli, and they look like a little bunch of grapes. And that alveoli is where that gaseous exchange takes place. So when we breathe in, they fill up with oxygen. And over those little alveoli are a little capillary network. And what the blood does is it picks up the oxygen and drops the carbon dioxide, then we breathe it out. It's a fascinating system. And Gray's Anatomy says we have 300 million of these. But in each little alveoli, there's a droplet of water. And because of the surface tension of water, do you understand the surface tension of water? When I trained as a hairdresser, I had to learn about surface tension of water. When you put water on your scalp, um, it doesn't really get through because of the oil. You put shampoo on, it breaks the surface tension of water and of course it can get through. Because of the surface tension of water, 
And this little minuscule droplet of water in the alveoli, when you breathe out, the majority of your carbon dioxide is breathed out. And so you can get a full quota of oxygen back in. In dehydration, we don't have that little bit of water. So when the person breathes out, they can't breathe out all their carbon dioxide. So that when they breathe in, they're not getting as much oxygen as they could be getting. So here's another point with the most vital element needed for life. We need to be well hydrated to be able to get that oxygen and we need to be having the proper salt and all of its minerals for the cell to utilize that water. So you can see there they all interact with each other. We need all of them. I had a man do our program it's a few years ago now, he's 44 and he had three main problems. He had a very congested chest. You see in dehydration to try and conserve the water loss with each breath, the little bronchioles shrink up. He had chronic headaches. You see the cells shrink when we're dehydrated and he had lower back pain. Did you know that 75% of our upper body weight is held in our lower back by water? So in a dehydrated body, there's not as much water there that should be there and the back hurts, the lower back gets painful. So he had these three main problems. I said to him, how much water do you drink a day? He said, I don't drink water. I said, no water? He said, no, I don't drink any water. He said, I don't like it. He said, I have a lot of headache tablets and I drink it down with Coke and cups of tea and coffee. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he was living on the pills because he had so much pain here. He had so much congestion here and he'd have antibiotic after antibiotic. Do you know, on last night on the news, 7.30 report stated that because of a little boy who nearly died from too many antibiotics, they're saying now we, doctors must stop prescribing so many antibiotics. It said last night on the news that Australia is the highest user of antibiotics of any country in the world. Isn't that incredible? Can you see what's the use of the antibiotic if this man's remaining dehydrated? That's why the detective hat has to be put on. Why are these things so? I said, no water. He said, no water. I said, uh-huh. As he went through the program, he started drinking more water. He started to drink almost a litre a day. Now the student might say to me, no, 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 Barbara, he's supposed to drink at least two, maybe two and a half litres a day. I said, it's, it's pretty good. Yesterday it was none. <laughs> build it up, little by little, build it up. By the end of the week, he was drinking two litres of water. He said, this is amazing. He said, I, don't, I haven't had headaches for two days. He said, first time since I can remember. He said, my chest is getting a lot looser. And he said, my lower back pain is gone. Whoa, what was his problem? It was dehydration. <laughs> Can you see if that point's not addressed? The osteopath who's trying to fix his back isn't gonna go far. <laughs> the doctor or the naturopath that's trying to fix his lungs aren't gonna go far. The neurosurgeon that's taking scans of his brain to try and find out why it's working is not going to get anywhere when it's just water. If someone has headaches and say to me, but I drink two litres of water a day, my answer to that is, well, it's not the water. <laughs> Let's go one step further and find out what it is. And it could be many things. That's why we have to be detectives. Have you ever seen Hercule Poirot, Agatha Christie's detective? He notes things no one else looks at. There's a little thread on the carpet. There's the little nick in the curtain. And everyone's rolling their eyes at the silly little things he's looking at. But in the final assessment of finding the, you know, who did the crime, those little points in the puzzle turn out to be some of the most important pieces of information. We need to be private investigators. We need to be Hercule Poirot's. We need to look at every point. I don't think we should run ourselves ragged finding every little point, but when you start investigating, you start to get an idea. 
and it was not hard to find out why this man was having his problems, especially at the end of the week when his lower back pain was gone, his headaches were gone and his chest was almost totally clear. It can take a little bit longer for all that to come up. I saw him six weeks later. He jumped out of the car, he had a, smooth, a huge smile on his face. He had a big bottle of water in his hand. He said, three litres a day. <laughs> He'd got his life back. It can be that simple. And that's why anyone that comes to me for help, I go through these eight laws because these are the true remedies. And often you can find little glitches here and there that give you an indication of why these things are so. A friend of Michael's is a bricklayer and he rang up Michael the other day. He's a bit of a rough bloke. He said, oh, he said, I got this lower back pain. He said, I've been to the chiropractor. He can't fix me. He said, all the blokes on the job site are getting it. Michael said, what do you drink? He said, oh, we all drink Coke. How much Coke do you drink a day? Oh, a couple of litres. Michael said, well, I've got a simple little test that you can try. Get rid of the Coke and drink water. He said, water? I said, is it just water? Michael said, do you remember that one? <laughs> remember what you used to drink? He said, right, oh, we've got nothing else to lose. Do you know within a couple of days, all the men had no lower back pains. <laughs> all the men were coming alive. <laughs> The work on the workforce improved. The output improved. They were all so happy. What, what was the change? It was just water. One of the problems with things like Coke and coffee, they contain two major dehydrating agents, which is the caffeine and the sugar. And so even if the person drinks one or two glasses a day, they're still not getting hydrated because the coffee and the Coke are taking it all away. It must be water and water alone. What's the best water? Well, the best water is pure water. And most taps today contain water that has fluoride and chlorine in it. The chlorine is not a huge problem because if you pour a jug and put it on the bench, within half an hour the chlorine has all evaporated, but the pro there is a problem with the fluoride. So we must get water filters. Uh, I think reverse osmosis is the main filter. There could be more, please do a search on it. I can't assure you because I don't know enough about water filters because we've never used one because we've always had the rainwater or the creek water. We have beautiful water here. So very important to drink good water. One man said to me, what about an alkaline water machine? Well, as you saw yesterday in our acid alkaline lecture, alkaline is very important. But alkaline water is not going to do a huge amount if the person is eating a lifestyle that is all acid, eating a food program that's all acid or partaking of a lifestyle that is all acid. It is true, an alkal alkaline water can be a contributing factor in, in the whole picture. So water, we need water. It's a not negotiable subject. You just got to find out how to get it in. I never used to drink water. I was breastfeeding or pregnant nonstop for 14 years. My last baby, I, fed, I breastfed for three years and I hardly ever drank water. I drank maybe one or two glasses a day. I commonly had headaches, commonly had migraines. Whenever we traveled, I hated traveling in the car because I always had a terrible headache at the end of the day. I also used to get terrible sinus problems. Do you know I don't get any of that now? When I discovered the importance of water drinking, little by little, I started to implement it. I used to say to my friends, I've just discovered a new medicine. The kids aren't getting colds anymore, a whole lot of things happening. And they said, what is it? I said, water, <laughs> just water. How many people get up in the morning and they don't have water? And in the morning is the most dehydrating time of the whole day. The best way to take water in is little by little by little by little. Your body can utilize it better. It's like a plant. If this plant was dry and I put 500 ml of water in there, we know where it would go. It would all run out the bottom. But if I put a half a cup in and then I come back and put another half cup in, then I come back and put another half cup in, I can maybe get nearly a liter in there without any running out. And it's the same with the body. Little by little is the best. 
The only time I will drink a whole glass of water at once would be when I wake up in the morning. Have you ever slept on a mattress on the floor and in the morning you lift up the mattress and it's all damp underneath? That's the water that you have lost in the night. That's why you have to be very careful of your bedroom because of the water that's coming out of your, your, your body in the night. That's why we always fold the bed clothes back and allow the bed to have a good air, have the windows open. It's even better if you can have a bedroom that has sun coming into the bed to purify it and air it. Important to try and get the mattress in the sun at least once a year. <laughs> Change your mattress protectors. Also be cautious of under the bed. Always should have slats or wire which allows the moisture that you lose in the night to come away. Many people are tired when they wake up because of the air in their bedroom. You must be very, very careful on the air in the bedroom and as we looked at earlier, the electromagnetic field in that bedroom as well. So water is lost every day, water must be replaced. And here is a good rule of thumb, 25 kilo of body weight, not two kilo. 25 kilo of body weight to one litre of water. That's a good rule to assess how much water the children drink. And it's also a good incentive for weight loss, isn't it? I always said to my children when they wake up, I used to, and I say to my grandchildren now, have you watered your garden yet? What's the garden? Of course, it's that lovely flora, flora inside your gut. In that uh, catalyst program called Gut Reaction, one, one professor said, there's a literal jungle in there. <laughs> so I say to my grandchildren, have you watered your garden yet? And they come up in the morning and say, Grandma, we've watered our garden. I said, I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased because now you can have breakfast. So it's always a rule in the home. If the child doesn't want to drink water, my answer is, I'm so sorry because you can't have breakfast now. <laughs> it's very simple. So lots of little ways to encourage the children to drink water. You will notice if the children don't drink water, as soon as they've eaten, then they want to drink their water. And what the water does is it neutralizes the stomach acid. We need that stomach acid to be about a pH of 2.5. That's very acid. And your stomach needs to be that acid. You will not feel it because you drank a glass of water half an hour before the meal. You've got a nice thick mucosa wall there. So you will not feel it. But that pH is necessary for the enzymes in the stomach to be activated to be able to break your protein down. That's why you stop drinking about half an hour before the meal and you start drinking about an hour and a half to two hours after the meal. If someone's thirsty when they eat, by all means have a mouthful, but at the same time, it needs to be assessed how much water has been drunk. So you can prevent needing to drink with your meals by, by drinking between your meals. As I said with exercise, not negotiable subject and so is water. It's a not negotiable subject. And if you get sick, if you have diarrhea or constipation or if you have a headache or cold, up your water intake. Dr. Christopher in America, he said, Here's a sign to tell if you're drinking too much water. Put your head on the side and if the water comes out your ears. In other words, it's almost impossible to drink too much water. The only time you could drink too much water is if you're not having those minerals. So as soon as you start drinking more water, you will start to, re to lose a few more minerals. So it's very important to have the proper salt. My suggestion is about a teaspoon of salt in a day, over the day. If a person's not used to having salt, I say start small. Start small, just little by little increase it and your body will adapt to that. Just as it adapts to no salt, it will start to adapt to proper salt. Third most vital element needed for life. Water is an amazing substance. Water can be used for healing too. 
Hydrotherapy is a huge subject. I have whole books written on hydrotherapy, which is water therapy. And the steam sauna that our guests have at night or in late afternoon, where they go into the little steam hut for about 10, 15 minutes and then have the cold shower, or if they're brave, they can run down to the creek and dive in the creek and then back in again. We're doing hot and colds. And by the third steam, the body temperature, the core body temperature can sometimes be up to 40 degrees. And when the body gets up to 40 degrees, circulation, metabolism increases by 400%. That's quite remarkable, isn't it? So when circulation and metabolism increase 400%, that means healing is increasing by 400%. Elimination of waste is being boosted 400 times. So that's quite remarkable. Not everyone has a steam bath, but it also explains why this is such an important part of a detox program. As I told you earlier, up to 70% of body's waste can come out of the body when the body is given the right conditions, and that condition is that steam. The only time a person may not be able to handle the steam is if they go into the steam bath dehydrated. So very important the person be well hydrated when they go in. But I'd like to just give you some very simple treatments now that you can use in the home. I had a lady ring me up one day and she said, Barbara, my 10 year old has just trodden on a rusty nail and she's not vaccinated. I said, aha. She said, we have your poultice DVD and so we've put a grated potato poultice on the wound. I said, good, that's a good choice. She said to me, but it's still a little bit swollen and it's still a little bit sore. I said, aha, well you can go one step further. Get two buckets of water and make one very hot and put the child's foot in the hot water for three minutes. How hot? As hot as the child can stand. <laughs> we don't want to burn the child. I always put a person's foot in my hand and I put my hand in the water so my hand is filling the water. And if the person cannot take it, the only time you would not do it would be someone who has poor circulation, maybe the very old or the very young, uh, someone who has diabetes and they can't feel their feet properly. That's the only time you would not do it. So three minutes hot water and then cold. And it's as cold as you can. Ideally put some ice cubes in that cold. And the cold is done for 30 seconds. So what's happening here is when the foot is put into hot water, we're warm blooded creatures. So immediately the blood rushes to the area. And when the blood rushes to the area, fresh blood's coming in and fresh blood is bringing more oxygen, more nutrients, more water, more white blood cell. And as it pushes the old out, it's throwing off the waste. Can you see that? Now, after three minutes, the blood starts to slow down because that's what happens when we're in a hot bath, isn't it? We start to slow down to the point of sleep. And so you pull the foot out of the bucket and into the ice cold. Will that wake it up? Woo. We are warm blooded creatures. And whenever cold touches our body, there's a reaction. And basically the body's going, whoa, cold. It has the potential to kill us quick, move fast. Can you see that's the reaction? Now within 30 seconds, the reaction has died down and the blood can start slowing down. So we put it back in the hot and wake it up again. So whenever you do the hot, you have a kettle of boiling water there and while the foot or the hand or whatever you're doing is in the cold, you heat up the hot with a bit of boiling water. Again, test it, test it. You do this whole thing three times always starting with the hot and always finishing with the cold. You see, finishing with the cold equalizes the circulation, closes pores, prevents chilling. The only time we've had someone faint in our steam bath is they had the steam and they didn't want to have the cold shower, so they went and st stood in the cool air. 
and then came back in. Cool air does not do what cold water does. It's the reaction of the cold water on the blood and that doesn't happen with cold air. If someone says, well, I want to do the steam, but not the cold, I say, well, I'm sorry, you can't do it. <laughs> because you'll be in trouble if you don't finish with that cold. It's only quick. It's only quick. So the lady did this to her little girl that had trodden on the rusty nail. Three minutes in the hot, 30 seconds in the cold. Three times. And then I said, put the grated potato on. I said, ring me in two hours. You see, if there's no response in two hours, what do I say? You go straight to hospital. I said, ring me in two hours. She rang me and she said, she's laughing. All her pain has gone. There is no redness at all around the foot. I said, good. <laughs> My suggestion would be with this girl to do hot and coals maybe three times a day. And you probably only need to do the grated potato poultice overnight. I always say, watch the body's reaction. And if, you're, if your body says, yes, remember, you're the doctor. Are you getting relief? I'll tell you another story similar. I was in New Zealand and I was seeing a lady. She brought her seven-year-old boy in. He was just with her while she talked to me. And my eye immediately went to his finger. Now this finger, the joint was all swollen. It was red and there was like a white pussy bit on top. I said, what's, what's the matter with the finger? She said, well, the doctor says it's cellulitis. You know what cellulitis is? Inflammation of the cell. I said, yes, I can see that. But what am I asking now? Why? Because that wouldn't have happened for no reason. She said, oh, a few days ago, he had a blister on his finger and he was playing in the dirt and the blister broke. Are we starting to see what happens? Aha. Uh -huh. I said, what have you been doing? It wasn't a few days ago, it was actually a few weeks ago because she said he's on his second course of antibiotics. He's having to take painkillers at night to sleep and sleeping tablets. So he's on three medication and he's seven. I said, um, do you mind if I try something? She said, not at all, not at all. Now I got the permission of the child. Always get the permission of the child because a man convinced against his will will be of the same opinion still. I always use the will. I said, can I do this? Can I just do the hot and coals? I told him what I was gonna do. I explained it, he nodded and I got two cups. He could not take the hot, so he made it a bit colder. He could not take it we made, until he could bear it. When he could bear it, after three minutes, we put his finger in ice cold. While he's in there, we put hot in the little hot mug. And then I said, get your good finger and put your good finger in there so that your brain can assess that that's not that hot. Yes. And this time his sore finger could bear the hot. He did it three times. By the end of it, a smile came to his face. In 15 minutes, we had reduced the pain by 50%. 15 minutes. What did we do? We just got fresh supplies of blood in, which took the old blood out. It's very simple. And then I grated a potato and I put it on his finger. His mother rang me the next day. She said, this is amazing. He woke up in the morning and said, can I do more hot and colds? So he'd experienced the relief. She said, by the end of the next day, by the second grated potato poultice, all the junk came out. He had no more pain. And if he does get pain, what does he do? Just goes back to this. She said, what will I do with the antibiotic? I said, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> I can tell you what I would do if you would like to ask. <laughs> she was so excited. It's so simple, isn't it? It's incredibly simple. So water is not just a powerful thing to take into our body. We can use it externally to bring relief with simple ailments. And before I close, I'll just give you one last one, which every home should know this remedy. And this is a straight hot foot bath. And it's done for a headache. It's done for a headache. It's done for if someone's highly stressed. It's done if someone has a congested chest or problems in their abdomen. You see our head, our chest and our abdomen have a reflex in the feet. 
and often there's congestion of blood if there's a problem here or here or in the head. So you put your feet in hot water and basically the brain goes, whoa, the feet need help, send extra blood down. So it takes the blood from the congested area. We have many guests come here that have um, headaches from caffeine withdrawals. So we're doing lots of hot foot baths. <laughs> 20 minutes in the hot foot bath, maybe every five minutes another little bit of boiling water. When the hot foot bath finishes, they put their feet up and you pour cold water over their feet and then dry it. Very simple treatment. Very simple. If someone's stressed out, bad headache, congestion in these areas, that's called a straight hot foot bath. You'll never look at water the same again, will you?